Hello and welcome to the IDA Young Leaders Program webinar series. Today we're joined by Nathan Hancock, Senior Director of R&D at Oasis Water. Before we start, let me tell you a little about the YLP. The IDA Young Leaders Program is open to any IDA member 35 years of age or younger and our primary goals are to promote desalination careers and also to provide a forum for communication for our members. In particular, we provide a monthly bulletin by email to our members, quarterly webinars such as this one today, and also a series of networking events at the major desalination and water conferences worldwide. You can join us at idayylp.org or by email you can email ylp at idayylp.org. We now move to our first webinar today, and I'll turn it over to Nathan Hancock, Director of Research and Development at Oasis Water. Over to you, Nathan. And thank you, Mike and application development. I um, appreciate the uh, Young Leaders Program here with IDA and the work that you guys are doing to promote awareness of desalination careers, and particularly some of the really pressing challenges we still have uh, in front of us for water treatment, repaired water treatment especially. And um, a lot of my talk today will focus on some interesting issues in industrial water treatment, desalination, and uh, some issues there involving confluence of water scarcity, uh, both the rising need of power and, and industry and extractive industries to tap limited water resources and continue to produce the goods and services we all rely on. Um, a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I'm trained as an environmental scientist and engineer. I'm also a licensed professional chemical engineer. Uh, I've spent the better part of uh, eight years working in generally water treatment technology, specifically uh, forward osmosis and a lot of uh, uh, additional work in, in treatment of industrial uh, waste streams and brines. Um, really, my, my background is a mixture of uh, environmental scientists, process engineering, uh, mass and heat transfer, and uh, material memory and material science. So with that, uh, let me get into uh, the talk here today. Move this up. OK. So really I'll be focusing on how we're going about optimizing Ford osmosis technology for various applications. A quick outline of the talk, I'll give a general overview of Ford osmosis technology and actually a more general overview of what we call osmotically driven membrane processes. From here I'll look at the architecture of Ford osmosis systems and what makes them special and unique and how we draw out those advantages for various applications. Finally, I'll focus on the different uh, solutions that Oasis as a company in particular is, is pushing into various markets and, and, and having quite a good uh, traction on that. So quickly, Ford Osmosis technology. I'll start actually here by, by noting that really if you look at the patent literature, you can see that there's been a remarkable growth in Ford Osmosis patent applications that have been published. Here I show just from the year 2000 to projected for 2014. And I think what this tells is a story of the rapid uh, commercialization of these technologies and considerable interest now in industry. If you look back uh, 10 and 15 years, you'll see a very similar trend in the academic literature, and now you also see a very strong uh, exponential increase there as well. But here you see it really uh, where the rubber meets the road, as it were, in the industrial application space. Just a few interesting areas in terms of timeline. You'll note that it was actually back in 1961 when some of the first patent literature was starting to be published by uh, Lorb and Sherujan around the asymmetric membrane. This is what became the heart of reverse osmosis systems, though interestingly, Sidney Loeb was also very interested in how to apply an osmotically driven membrane process called pressure retarded osmosis for the generation of energy from salinity gradients. I'll touch on that slightly, um, but just to note that it's, it's been some time since this interest was really born, and, and now we're only just starting to see the fruits of, of this technology development as it continues to grow. I'll note that OASIS was founded in 2009. We conducted our first field pilot in 2011, and today we're a, a commercial organization pushing projects on multiple continents, and uh, it's quite an exciting time 
for both our company, but I think more broadly for Osmosis. Uh, there's a number of entries into the market, various players, and, and all are doing quite interesting work. So here I'll focus uh, really on the broader subset of technology called osmotically driven membrane processes, of which Ford Osmosis is a subset. But really here, I'll show the graph on the left as I go through several slides, so I'll orient you a little bit. Uh, on the vertical axis there is really the direction of water transfer. So think about it in terms of which way the, nat the water will naturally want to diffuse through the membrane. So my positive reference is water doing what we call direct osmosis, just transferring from an area of low salinity to high salinity, much in the same way that your body or tree roots work as they extract water from the environment. On the horizontal axis, you can see the gradient. This is a thermodynamic gradient that's pushing water one way or the other through the membrane. It's a mixture of the osmotic pressure gradient, as denoted by the delta pi, and the hydraulic pressure gradient, as denoted by delta p. On the top, you can see water flux. And really, the amount of water we're able to move through these membranes is related to a proportionality constant, which is actually the, think about it as the mass transfer resistance of the membrane. It's the water permeability of the membrane material times that thermodynamic gradient of the osmotic pressure and the hydraulic pressure. So the simplest way to use osmotic technologies for doing beneficial separation is, is taking advantage of selective mixing of solutions. And here on the right-hand side, what I show you is if you have a brine of a high salinity and a feed solution of a lower salinity, what will happen is that in the presence of an asymmetric membrane connecting the two solutions, this membrane is semi-permeable. It's more permeable to the solvent or water in most cases than it is to the electrolytes in either solution. That barrier of the electrolytes creates that osmotic pressure gradient, which actually is a chemical potential gradient that moves water down, uh, down a chemical potential gradient. Now, the use of this uh, technology for beneficial separation is really focuses on having a brine that is either abundantly available or readily consumable. Um, this can be used in a number of different applications. We call them generally osmotic dilution or direct osmosis or osmotic concentration. Osmotic concentration has been used in things like uh, food and, and beverage services, you know, concentrating tomato paste, for instance, where you have thermal sensitivity to the end product and you don't want to heat that to drive off water. Osmotic dilution is, is actually an interesting use of one of the first commercial applications of forward osmosis by HTI. Uh, using a product they call HydroPack, which is basically a juice pouch with a membrane on one side. And that pouch can be thrown into various types of impaired water. It will extract water and dilute that sugar solution, and then uh, the user can punch a straw in it and actually drink that. Um, so it's market, but certainly the first adaptation of um, What I'll notice is that as that activity occurs, the brine continues to pull water until it dilutes. And as that dilution occurs, you have lower and lower gradient to drive mass transfer or water transfer. So this process becomes limited by how much osmotic pressure you have stored or how much energy you have stored in the brine in its own state. Now, I'll show you how this contrasts with forward osmosis in a moment. We're actually engineering the brine solution to be recycled and reused in forward osmosis. Before I talk about that, I want to hit two uh, adjacent technologies. One is uh, power generation, and that is the use of what we call pressure retard osmosis to draw a uh, energy, of mechanical and eventually electrical energy, from salinity gradients. So here we will apply pressure on the brine side, enable that pressure to build up and spill that through a hydro turbine to create mechanical energy and electrical energy. This is an interesting technology, one that uh, Stockcraft championed for some time, and actually, interestingly, Stockcraft has made a strategic decision to move out of this market, but many other players have actually uh, taken up the baton and, and are continuing to run with this, both in open cycle processes and also in closed cycle systems like the uh, Osmotech solution for closed circuit PRO. So quite interesting work is being done here to date as well. Now I'll focus actually more specifically on forward osmosis technology. And when we talk about forward osmosis in the industry, we're really thinking about water purification. So it's not the dilution of a brine, but it's the ability to create final product water, fresh water, that actually has various industrial uses and, and can basically be thought of as analogous to an RO permeate in terms of quality. The, the real beauty about a forward osmosis process is that basically you're decoupling two problems that you're usually used to dealing with at the same time in parallel. So in RO or in thermal processes, you want to both drive separation of water to produce a purified water, but you also need to deal with the fact that that water most likely has a lot of impurities and different constituents that make it difficult to extract a lot of water. 
In fluid osmosis, what we basically do is take these two problems that are usually in parallel and break them into series. This means that in the feed side, we're exposing the feed only to ambient temperature and pressure and using a very gentle thermodynamic gradient to move water through the membrane. That means we don't accelerate, accelerate or exacerbate challenges with respect to uh, sparingly soluble salts, mineral scaling, uh, retrograde solubility, and certainly organic or inorganic colloidal material fouling on, on surfaces. By doing that, we can then take the water into a really simple electrolyte environment where we can then impose various types of draw solution reconcentration processes that can be leveraged to operate at their maximum efficiencies to extract the fresh water. I'll tell you that this basically gives you a couple of advantages and really allows you to take over where RO may fail or leave off, and we'll go into that in more detail. Now, I'll note that uh, one of the things that's gaining more interest in, in the uh, academic sphere but has actually been sort of the de facto reality for uh, Ford Osmosis technology companies is the use of what we call pressure-assisted Ford Osmosis. In this process, we're actually applying a slight pressure to the feed solution. Uh, and as you can see on the figure on the left, this actually helps to increase mass transfer. Really, in high salinity cases, it's only slightly. In lower salinity cases, it can be significant. The reason for this is typically as you look at high recovery FO processes, you have a long membrane array. And that long membrane array has its own pressure drops. And many uh, groups are working to reduce those. But you want to typically keep a higher pressure gradient from feed solution to draw solution so as to not damage the membrane by reversing the gradient and potentially delaminating the active layer. So this is, this is really reality for, for most FO applications, is they will operate in some manner like this. So now I want to contrast this with reverse osmosis. So forward osmosis and osmotically driven technologies are leveraging osmotic pressure to perform beneficial separations, whereas reverse osmosis is basically having to apply hydraulic pressure to fight and overcome the osmotic pressure of the solution and produce and permeate. That can be shown here, and, and basically what you notice on the graph on the left is that we have now reversed the gradient, where our delta P is greater than our osmotic pressure gradient, delta pi. That changes the way that water transfers through the membrane. And in some cases, in, in reverse osmosis, you're basically limited by how much hydraulic pressure you can really apply to overcome the osmotic pressure of a brine. This typically means in most cases, you're limited to about 1,000 PSI, or roughly 70 bar, of applied hydraulic pressure. And that gets you a, a high-end brine concentration of typically around 70,000, maybe 80,000 milligrams per liter for most mixed electrolyte streams. So it gives you an upper bound as far as how much recovery you can really push in RO. I want to take a moment to talk a little bit more about some differences in reverse osmosis and forward osmosis. In reverse osmosis, you can really think about it as a sort of plug flow reactor. In Ford osmosis, you have an interesting analog to more of a counterflow heat exchanging uh, process design, or in this case, it's a counterflow mass exchanger. So if you look at the figure on the bottom left, what you'll notice is that as water is being pushed through the RO process, you're continuing to extract fresh water, but you're continuing to concentrate the remaining water in that solution. Meanwhile, you have a limited amount of hydraulic pressure that you've applied. So while at the front end of the membrane array, we have no recovery, you have very high flux. As you push down the membrane array, what you typically see in most RO applications is that that gradient becomes smaller and smaller. The water flux becomes less and less. The permeate quality suffers. Um, it, it becomes an issue in terms of how you design these systems. Uh, you basically have a really nice way of, of uh, producing a, a measured and, and uh, relatively consistent thermodynamic uh, gradient across the entire recovery regime, which gives you very uniform flux and quite uniform performance across the mass transfer space, which is it's helpful for a number of applications, particularly high fouling and scaling streams. I also want to talk a little bit about water flux and the way that in Ford osmosis technologies, it's a bit nuanced compared to RO. In reverse osmosis, what I show here on the graph on the bottom is water flux is a function of salinity. So as the TDS, and here I'm using a sodium chloride TDS, and I'm modeling this based on a Dow XLE RO membrane, top of the line RO membrane, what you can see is that because you're limited by how much hydraulic pressure you can push on these systems, as you start to go to very high salinity regimes, your water flux drops off precipitously. And because you don't have the water flux going through to dilute what is more or less a constant mass transfer of salts, your permeate quality also suffers considerably. Now, in the case of forward osmosis, in the way that we'll use thermolytic draw solutions with very high osmotic pressure up to 350 bar 
of driving force. It enables us to push extremely high recoveries. Uh, we can go out to more than uh, 300,000 milligrams per liter in some cases. And, and really what this means is we're able to maintain that very steady water flux profile across the array. And what you'll notice is as we're dealing with these very high salinities, we still have the issue of certainly forward mass, tr mass transfer in terms of uh, salts that will diffuse, co-diffuse with water through the membrane. And as a result, even a very high rejection membrane will typically have a permeate of around 1,000 milligrams per liter. This is actually, in most industrial applications, not a concern, but actually in others where we actually want to push very high product water purity, uh, we can do that quite well by integrating forward osmosis technology with existing technologies. And I'll show you a specific example of that in a moment in our ZLD applications. Now, this is just a little bit of a breakdown about how I think about the technology landscape and how these various processes compare. If you look at the left side of the axis here, you see energy. That's an easy way to think about some of these systems. And really, if you look at NF and RO processes, you note that uh, they are incredibly energy efficient in the separations that they do. And where they can be leveraged effectively is absolutely the technology of choice, particularly where you have low fouling streams and moderate to low salinities. Now, if you look at the top of this band, you'll see thermally driven processes uh, and really thermal evaporative technologies like brine concentration and crystallizers. Really, any technology that is basing its uh, separation on the evaporation of water will have relatively high energy demand. Uh, certainly, they've been able to reduce that considerably in time, but it's still much higher than, say, reverse osmosis. The other challenge with a lot of these brine constraining technologies is because you're applying heat to this mixed electrolyte solution, which may have a number of corrosive materials in it, even certainly chloride and fluoride at high concentrations become very corrosive. Uh, the challenge is that not only is it energy intensive, but the capital and materials of construction also become very expensive. Typically, in a low fluoride stream with high chlorides, you use titanium, but if you also have high fluorides, you then need to switch to high nickel alloys like castelloy and inkloy, and the cost can be quite high. I'll also note that in terms of energy, what I show here is actually for uh, pretty ideal circumstances in many evaporators. Now, often, uh, batch brine concentrating evaporators will typically be more in the range of, say, 30 to 50, and crystallizers could be as much as 100 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. So I'll contrast that with the middle ground here in forward osmosis. And what you can note is that certainly forward osmosis and reverse osmosis hybrid systems uh, implicitly have a higher energy demand than a standalone reverse osmosis process. Basically, it's entropically unfavorable to pull water into a higher uh, salinity environment and then extract that with RO. So from an energy side, you certainly will pay a penalty in that separation. The interesting thing is because that forward osmosis membrane can deal with more complex and challenging and difficult water streams, you can leverage that ability to save on other items of operations expense or capital expense in terms of upfront technologies for the RO system to be able to operate. Things like uh, chemical precipitation, DAF, UF. The FO can take a lot of those materials without that type of costly and additional pretreatment. In the case of uh, the forward osmosis membrane brine concentrator, which is a technology uh, that Oasis is pioneering, this is an opportunity to use forward osmosis for high salinity applications, to leverage that ability to use low pressure, low energy separation of the streams, and then uh, be able to have a much broader salinity range. Uh, and if you look at this technology, it's really taking waters where RO can fail to treat because of high salinity, but then giving you the advantage and the horsepower of a brine concentrator to push high recovery at a lower energy than the thermal evaporators. So really this is, uh, to sort of summarize all of that, what you can basically see is the application envelope that really we as a technology company focus on as a forward osmosis provider. We're looking at waters that are both higher salinity and higher fouling potential. We like to companion and, and be a, a, a good partner with reverse osmosis technologies. And then often our technologies will actually be a solutions integrator and, and really provide a complete solution to our end user, which may involve all three of these types of processes, say RO, uh, the Oasis platform, and some crystallizer technology. And I'll get more into some of our ZLD offerings in a moment. So with this, one thing I just want to impress is that Ford Osmosis is not one particular component. There's actually three very specific components that all must work in unison to actually be able to drive significant performance and value in a given application. It's the membrane and the membrane module, it's the draw solution, and the draw solution recovery scheme that really make the process. And then it's how you package all of that together into a complete solution uh, that, that really enables Oasis in particular to be very effective at addressing market needs and different pain points in various markets. I'll note that 
to the earlier slide on the growth in, in patent publications, uh, what's quite exciting for us is this space is, is certainly relatively new. There's a lot of opportunity for growth here, and we've been able to capitalize on that, I think, quite well. Here I'll show you a little bit about the architecture of a forward osmosis uh, process, generally looking at the membrane, the draw solution, and the systems integration. From a membrane side, most of you, I'm sure, will have good familiarity with reverse osmosis processes. Here you're really only concerned about one directional mass transfer, both water and salt. So there's one mass transfer boundary layer that you want to deal with and, and uh, optimize, but generally you want that membrane to be pretty thick and able to withstand uh, very high hydraulic pressure. Uh, so you want that porous support to be thick and able to absorb that mechanical stress. In forward osmosis, it's quite different. You have actually bidirectional mass transfer. You have directional transfer of water, but you also have transfer of feed salts into the draw solution and draw salts into the feed solution. That membrane has to be optimized for all of these different interactions. And in particular, this porous support material, and what I have highlighted here is the dilutive internal concentration polarization in red, is a key area that has to be very carefully optimized in terms of membrane performance. And that's just to get high water flux, not to mention the active layer that has to be specially ta tailored for various draw solutions and applications to make sure that that bidirectional mass transfer is something that one, you can control, and two, that uh, you really can, can drive value from. So just to drive this point home, what I'll show you quickly is that if you take a commercial high performance thin film composite RL membrane shown here on the left, and you look at its water flux compared to a membrane that's been designed for Ford osmosis process, such as the thin film composite that we make, under various you know, under a very specific uh, condition in Ford osmosis, you'll note that the water flux performance is dramatically higher. And that's because we've taken great care to shape that membrane. Effectively, effectively our membrane will uh, be about uh, a third uh, of the uh, thickness of an RO membrane and two-thirds of mass. So we've shaped a lot of material out of that process. So now we'll go into the, the draw solution itself. Um, we really look at thermolytic draw solutions because they have significant potential to increase the application envelope and the aperture that we can use to address various market challenges is so much greater than a standard electrolyte that you might use in the FORO process. Thermolytic draw solutions are interesting because basically you start with inert gases and we can diffuse these into water. They basically form an electrolyte mixture. That electrolyte mixture has very high solubility and very uh, high diffusion uh, properties which make it very good as a draw solution able to convey the thermophysical driving force in the process. We can then take these electrolytes and heat them and as we heat them, it'll basically overcome the higher vapor pressure of these salts and liberate them into the gas phase. We can then capture, condense, and reabsorb them and reuse them in a closed loop. The key to this process is that instead of evaporating water and overcoming the enthalpy of vaporization for water, we're looking at overcoming the enthalpy of vaporization for the salt. And that allows us to drive a fundamental energy advantage in these high salinity separations. I'll give you a picture of how that draw solution is leveled, uh, leveraged then into actually a system. In particular, uh, this is our uh, forward osmosis membrane brine concentrator system. You can see that by using the forward osmosis membrane in the front of the process, we're able to, again, affect that separation of all the different impurities in that brine solution at ambient temperature and pressure, drive that water into a benign electrolyte environment here, where we can apply, uh, I apologize here, where we can apply heat of various types, both low-grade heats from different industrial sources, in some cases, uh, high-grade heats and gensets and, and combined heat power systems. We can use a lot of different types of heat to drive this transfer. Basically strip those draw solution solutes, condense and reabsorb them, meanwhile never evaporating the water itself and producing a clean water product. That enables us to drive a significant energy advantage compared to evaporative technologies for similar treatments. So now I want to focus a little bit on some of our specific solutions in forward osmosis. Really, as a company, we focus on the natural resource extractive industry space, and the power and energy space. And these really break into two different types of classes of water. Some naturally occurring, uh, occurring hypersaline waters, others related to RO concentrates. So again, where RO leaves off, FO can pick up, continue to drive high recovery. These markets are split into a number of things, oil and gas, mining, refining, power, and industrial. You can see on the bottom several uh, photographs from different waters that we treat. You'll notice that these are different, definitely challenging waters. A couple uh, specific applications to mention, uh, 
at Oasis, we're, we've done quite a bit of work in the oil and gas produced water field, uh, treating waters that may come to us anywhere from, say, 70,000 to as much as 150,000 milligrams per liter in the feed. And really, as a company, our interest is providing a complete solution to the end user. And so we'll actually integrate Ford Osmosis technology with existing processes uh, and leverage all of those to provide both high quality uh, fresh water stream that can be reused in these types of operations. And interestingly, in this space, it's also very important to provide a clean, high quality brine as the final product because this brine is used as a completion fluid. They call it a 10 pound brine. Uh, and meeting the customer specs for that allows you to actually achieve more value in the application. Here I'll also talk quickly about some of our work in uh, zero liquid discharge applications. In particular, in China, what's so fascinating is that roughly every two weeks, there's another 500 megawatt plant, coal-fired power plant being uh, commissioned in China. And a lot of these plants are actually in areas with acute water scarcity. So this gives us the opportunity to go into these plants and enable them to use their water very efficiently. And again, by using Forosmosis technology, enable them to save on parasitic energy draw from the power plant and, and doing these types of zero liquid discharge applications. Um, if you're interested, there was a report um, in Water Desalination uh, report that was uh, articulating some of the actual specifics of this process. Uh, we've already announced our first uh, project, ZLD project in China, and we'll be executing on that later this year. So this the, getting close to the last slide here, and what I want to just draw on is that really Ford Osmosis is being used and leveraged for a number of applications in the world. It, at Oasis, we really focus on the ones that I show here. Different regions, different uh, local economics, and the way that water scarcity and water demand drive the need for treatment are really pushing the need for advanced water treatment technologies beyond what people have available to them today. And certainly, uh, when you think about high concentration in ZLD applications, the need for brine concentration without wanting to go to a full evaporative brine concentrator is also quite interesting. And here I show a number of photographs from various applications and installations around the world. So just some key takeaways to summarize. Uh, what I would say is that Ford Osmosis is a complementary process to RO. We'll pick up where RO either fails because of fouling or leaves off because of osmotic pressure. It's a good alternative to evaporative technologies. It's more capital efficient and operation cost efficient. us and a number of other plans as well as multiple applications of interest. And one of the really interesting things I'd say is that this technology is still in the early days of commercialization. And so many of the uh, competitive processes we're competing in may be 60 to even 100 years old in case of, say, mechanical vapor compression evaporators. So really, we're just at the forefront, the frontier of developing these technologies. We're already getting good market traction, but now there's opportunity to continue to push these even higher in terms of performance and reducing cost. Um, and certainly, I think we're, Ford Osmosis has huge potential to be a game changer in zero liquid discharge applications, which we're seeing increasingly uh, a significant issue around the world. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Uh, and I believe Ronan will take over and I'm happy to manage any questions there. Great. Thank you very much, Nathan, um, for bringing us through the forward osmosis process and telling us about the latest steps in Oasis Adventures. And we do have some time now for questions, and so for any viewers, we'd invite you to post questions onto the YouTube channel just below the video that you're watching right now. Um, Nathan, I, I thought I'd start off by um, talking a bit about um, the main market where forward osmosis is entering in Oasis' case. And um, it seems to me like um, one major market is replacing um, traditional evaporators. And so I was curious whether you could tell us a bit about the challenges you have found for your, um, tell us about the challenges that your customers have using um, vapor compression and where the real pain points are for them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think the interesting thing about uh, the general evaporator market, particularly brine concentration in the industrial space is that often in these projects, the water quality that one assumes they will get at the onset of the project when you start doing the design is not the water chemistry, even remotely in some cases, that you actually end up receiving uh, when you put the technology into the field and commission it. In this case, evaporative technologies uh, 
can really struggle with uh, the difference in those electrolyte chemistries and the difference in, say, flow and salinities. Uh, things like boiling point elevation become an even more significant issue, and the ability to operate those systems efficiently can, can, be, um, can be quite challenging. In fact, um, there are a number of instances where evaporators have just failed at startup. One of the interesting things about the Ford osmosis process is, again, by kind of decoupling those issues of water chemistry impurities with the actual need to do the separation of freshwater production, is that we can be more flexible with both uh, turndown in terms of capacity, but also are much more flexible with the type of water chemistry that we receive. So as that fluctuates on a daily, monthly basis, the process is less sensitive to that. Right, right. And I know because there are quite a few different uh, areas where for osmosis might have an advantage. Is there, do you find with your customers that it really just boils down to one? Does it just boil down to maybe the energy or does it boil down to the reliability or would you say it's, it's actually ended up just being a mix? Yeah, it's a great question. It's, it's amazing. The markets are so diffuse and uh, the needs of the customers vary considerably. Some are very capital sensitive and some are very operation cost sensitive. And some uh, have had bad experiences with existing technologies and really look for low maintenance, high utilization. And so I can't say that any particular uh, instance there's, there's one obvious solution, but really it ends up being a mixture in, in how we blend. And as a, as a early stage company, it's nice for us. We have quite a bit of flexibility in our business models to be able to address those types of challenges and different uh, nuances and customer needs. Right, really nice. So another aspect that's interesting about the OASIS process is the thermal regeneration. And um, in some ways, people might compare that to a direct thermal process, again, like vapor compression. So I was wondering if you could maybe talk through some of the fundamental reasons why the thermal regeneration can, can get some benefits, maybe in terms of CapEx and, and OpEx as well, just compared to that um, vapor compression process again. Happy to. Yeah, so... Uh, maybe the quickest way to describe that is that because the water separation from all of those impurities, right, the things that tend to have very high corrosion potentials or very high retrograde solubility uh, and scaling potential, because that's happening at ambient temperature and pressure in forward osmosis, all the materials of construction on that side of the process are essentially non-corroding polymeric materials, Schedule 80 PVC, for instance. So it's a really inexpensive technology. And then as you go to the back side of the, of the process, you don't have the high chlorides or the high fluorides that necessitate high metal, uh, high grade metal alloys for heat exchanging components, heat transfer surfaces. So it allows you to have more flexibility with material selection. In terms of the actual OPEX and the, the way that the heat transfer is used in the process, again, that ability to now not have to evaporate and boil off all the product water you want to produce, but to evaporate and essentially condense these gases uh, gives you that, that energy advantage there as well. Right, really nice, really nice. So there's there's clearly a there's a clear advantage there in terms of a simpler chemistry. Um, another aspect that might be interesting to um, to the viewers is um, issues with the scale of the process. I believe in in vapor compression, building small compressors um, can often be quite challenging. And sometimes when you're producing maybe a thousand barrel a day plant, um, it can be difficult to uh, to get the machinery that's going to perform efficiently. Um, are there any maybe interesting stories around kind of those issues of scalability um, that, that apply to the OASIS process or maybe that are better compared to uh, vapor compression? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I think, you know, certainly in terms of really any type of separation processes, you benefit from large scale. Things become more efficient, become easier. So OASIS benefits is, uh, in a similar way as any adaptive technology might from that. What's great about the small scale systems is that the, the way that we use heat in the process is quite flexible. We can now use direct thermal inputs. In the case of produced water, uh, for instance, you, know, you have a lot of natural gas on site, which is actually available at a quite low cost. So you can use that natural gas and go through a GenSet or CHP process and, and basically be able to capture exhaust heat, reuse, and be really efficient use of that thermal resource without having to go all the way to vapor compression. So it gives you a lot of flexibility in, in how you apply or employ that thermal energy resource. Right, great, great. And kind of to follow on on, on your point on the, the benefits of fouling for forward osmosis, um, we have, of course, in literature quite a number of studies of kind of zero-dimensional uh, units of forward osmosis. 
And um, so I'm curious, maybe, if you could share some of the benefits at a system level of the fouling performance of forward osmosis, perhaps um, from the perspective of cleaning, because you have this equal flux along the unit, um, or perhaps um, there are other benefits that you've seen that just mm -hmm. haven't been acknowledged on a lab scale. Sure. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, there's certainly those benefits of having a uniform flux profile, and also I, I wouldn't understate the importance of uh, having these both loose colloidal organic, but also inorganic colloidals like silica, and also inorganic scales, which set up very differently under an ambient temperature environment than they do under a high pressure or high temperature environment. Basically, in those high temperature, high pressure environments, you exclude water from the matrix, forces that to consolidate and become more hydrophobic, more prone to fouling. But I think most interestingly and perhaps most understated is the fact that you do have bidirectional mass transfer in forward osmosis. This can be a limitation in some cases, but it can also be leveraged and used as a benefit where we can actually affect different electrochemical properties of the membrane active layer right at that critical interface of the feed solution and the active layer interface by really uh, changing what's happening in the electrochemical properties of the solution and the draw solution side. So it gives you this ability to actually induce changes right at the critical place of mass transfer that you don't have in reverse osmosis. Right. Yeah, that's certainly a point I wasn't uh, fully aware of myself. And I wonder, um, just leading on to my next question, is that one area you think forward osmosis researchers might like to consider? Um, or what are the other areas that you would um, point researchers in if they want to do more research on this topic? Yeah, I think that, um, in, in my view, from a, from a research side, particularly thinking about academic research, the membrane is still sort of the microprocessor of the system. Without a good membrane, the rest of the system, the draw solution, the recovery process, has a very difficult time falling into place and, and allowing you to derive the kind of value you need to from that application or process. So that membrane is still the critical part. It's certainly an area that uh, our company, as well as many others, are, are spending a lot of time in cycles continuing to improve. I think uh, the draw solution chemistry side is certainly interesting. There continues to be a lot of work. And in fact, if you look at a lot of the patent literature, there's probably, I would hazard a guess, more work that's been focused on draw solution selection than on the membrane side itself. Both are significant, but um, draw solution continues to be a main focus of um, a lot of different work. In my opinion, there's maybe less traction to really be gained there. Um, I think we've, we've done some pretty exhaustive studies at Oasis and I think much more, more broadly in the industrial academic community of different draw solution types. There's some interesting candidates, but cost uh, is, is a critical factor in those draw solutions as you get to large scale. So I'd really focus on, I think, membrane. Right, great, Nathan. And maybe finally then, just to touch on the pretreatment process, I know for very challenging waters it's conventional just to do lime softening uh, and take out pretty much everything as far as possible except for sodium chloride. Um, are there any improvements that you've come across or what do you see as the future of pretreatment for these membrane systems? Yeah, it's a fantastic question and, and one that I think uh, we're seeing quite a bit of both on the academic side and the industrial side uh, research into how to better leverage those fouling, uh, I guess that lower fouling potential of port osmosis membrane in those types of applications. Um, so I think that will continue to be a body of work that flushes out over the next several years. Right, right. And uh, we've touched a lot on kind of scalance and uh, foulance. What about oils and grease? Is that something that has um, posed challenges? And, and how do you deal with, with oil and grease content in the feed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. So what we've certainly seen in, in our own activities in the oil and gas produced water work is that the membrane does have a not infinite uh, tolerance to oil and gas, but a considerable tolerance to it. Uh, so we'll typically deal with COD concentrations, for instance, on the order of, say, uh, 1,500 to 2,000 milligrams per liter directly on the FL membrane. But um, you know, I, I think generally, as, as we are looking at providing a full integrated solution to the end customer, the customer doesn't want to look to us as a independent contractor of multiple parts of the treatment train, we have to deliver a full solution. And in that, it gives us the ability to leverage uh, really simple upfront technologies to do some of the bulk of that oil water separation and applications where that's necessary. Yeah, great, Nathan. And um, just like to thank you very much for joining us today. I think it's, it's fantastic to have a company like Oasis join us. 
um, that's pushing desalination maybe beyond some of the traditional markets. And it's fascinating um, just to hear the overall insight into the process and also the market um, that you're looking into at the moment. Um, so with that, I'm going to wrap things up. I'm Ronan McGovern. I'm co-chair of the Young Leaders Program at IDA. I'd also like to thank Mike Dixon, my co-chair, who has been organizing this webinar in the background. We'll be back for our next webinar on the second week of December. But until then, goodbye. Thank you.